Recently, Pope Francis was meeting with the heads of women's religious orders, Catholic sisters, and in a Q&A session, one woman religious, one head of a woman's religious order, asked the Pope about women deacons. Why aren't there women deacons? And the Pope, Pope Francis said, I'll have to think about that. I'd like to set up a commission. Uh, there was some question about whether or not he was serious, but uh, it turned out he was serious. And he recently set up a, a formal papal commission to study women deacons. Uh, and it really brought it back in the news, and this is one of the reasons we're talking about it today. So I want to ask our panelists, I think for me the most interesting question of all, what are the arguments, theological, historical, ecclesiological, pastoral, and ecumenical, uh, for and against women deacons? Um, and, and maybe we can start with historical. What are the historical arguments in favor or against uh, women deacons? Well, certainly, you know, women were deacons there from the beginning, and uh, we know that, we've recognized that. Part of the historical argument also has to do with um, the way in which early texts, early ordination texts for women deacons indicated clearly that they were receiving the laying on of hands, and so that they were brought very clearly into the story. This faded after a while, and probably for a variety of reasons. Which reasons, what would you say? Um, certainly, the role as the, as the church became more uh, a product of um, sort of an institutional vision, I think that the place for women was overridden to some extent. And the other thing is that while women often ministered to women as deacons, they were not sort of the parallel of men deacons. They were often uh, slighted into ministering to women. I think in some ways the story about the church became, frankly, more male and there was less reason to have an accommodation for women. What Another thing that happened, uh, though, which is really interesting to me from the liturgical point of view, is that there uh, became a, a, an interpretation of the altar as being sacred in a sense that was derived from the Hebrew scriptures. And this arose in the 10th and 11th century that more of these taboos uh, relating to menstruating women came to the fore and it was decided that women shouldn't be anywhere near the altar. And so it, women had served at the altar in the early church, but then uh, these other ideas about uh, women being unclean and therefore not uh, able to do altar service mm -hmm. did play a role in the limiting or discontinuation of the diaconate for but, women. But Rita, Rita, did that have to do with uh, a, you know, sort of a retrieval of these these sort of ancient taboos about women menstruating, or did that have to do with a changing understanding of what an altar was and what was going on there? I suspect it had to do with the difference between ancient civilization being a bathing culture mm -hmm. and medieval situations not having clean water and not bathing. I, frankly, I think this was really <laughs> quite a uh, you know visceral thing mm -hmm. that there was a. You know, uh, I, that's my suspicion, okay? I haven't written a dissertation yeah. on this. Without question, we have the greatest amount of evidence for a female diaconate in Byzantium than we have anywhere else in the world, right? Uh, you have it in Jerusalem, you have it in Constantinople, you have it in Thessalonica, you even have it in southern Italy when it's controlled by the Byzantines, right? Um, it, uh, it does die out, um, probably 11th or 12th century, and people have put forward the arguments you're putting forth. At the exact same time that this is happening, the liturgical rite in Constantinople is being transformed. Um, the, the cathedral rite uh, that was used in the, church, the great church of Hagia Sophia, um, which had very specific rubrics for female deacons, became replaced by a Jerusalem rite that came out of a male monastery. So I'm not so sure that it's a specific, uh, it's a specific choice to remove women from the service of the altar so much as it is for a variety of geopolitical reasons. You have the Crusades, you have the rise of Islam, you have, you have all of this. You have the appropriation of a new liturgical rite in Constantinople that is based on a space in which they didn't have women serving. Um, and, and that sort of took over the Eastern Christian tradition, um, where we have the best attestation for, for what's happening. You know, you said very bluntly, you've all said, yes, yes, there were women deacons, yes, there were women deacons, here's what they did. Uh, and yet, uh, when that um, argument is put forth, it's often cut down by people. And in fact, the former papal commission said that, you know, there really weren't what we consider to be women deacons. Why is there so much 
um, sort of argumentation about the, the historicity. Um, are, the, are the documents somehow uh, up for interpretation? Um, you know, all of you say, the, yes, they're Roman deacons, and that may come as a surprise to a lot of our viewers, and in fact to uh, some theologians and some commentators, they say, no, they're absolutely were not. How can there be so much discrepancy on the simple historicity of that? Well, for the, for the West, to be fair, for the West, to be fair, there were, there were only a few examples that we have that are extant of these ordination rites and these specific named persons. And many of them are, they're not parallel examples to the male deacons at that time, and they're not parallel examples to anything like the diaconate today. So in that sense, this is, this is the history question again. I mean, did we have male deacons? Well, when exactly did we start having priests? You know, it's just these are, these are things that emerged in the church. Mm -hmm. And in the Latin church, after the early Middle Ages, it was verboten. So. I also think that you tend to read history based on your present experience. And so in some ways, it seems to me, some of the studies have taken within uh, their bias, uh, can be looked at a second time and seen perhaps differently through uh, eyes that might uh, uh, evaluate the evidence a little bit differently. So, for instance, Gary Macy wrote a wonderful historical essay on this in the book called Women Deacons, and he induces all these examples of identical practices with women being ordained and men being ordained to the diaconate and so on. The International Theological Commission gives us, uh, a, it only puts ordained in qu scare quotes. You know, it will not say that they were ordained because it takes a very uh, cautious and critical view of the sources which are out there as being partial, uh, unpersuasive, and so on. But you have to ask yourself, well, what is really the case here? You know, and sometimes in history, you do look at the same sources and get different answers depending on what pair of glasses you have on. There really is very little evidence for female diaconate in the city of Rome. Um, very little evidence for it. You do have, and in fact, you actually have a synonymous um, decretal attributed to a, a fifth century pope that forbids it. Yeah. Now, that of course means that it's probably going on, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and it wasn't actually written by him, we know that. But, but there is, uh, you know, it, it's clearly be, there's an attempt to shut it down um, in, in, the, uh, in the early sixth century. Um, in, in the Roman church. Um, in the Eastern church at the same time, it, it's very active. Uh, I, I mean, you would just, it would just be ridiculous to claim that you, there isn't a female diaconate. What is open to question, though, is what was their role, right? And, and as we talked about in our previous segment, the role of the, of the male deacon has transformed so much over time. And so if you come to these questions with present concerns, Right? And the role of the present deacon is potentially different than, the female, than it was in the fourth century, so too with the female deacon. Um, but one of the things that's interesting, in, uh, two more points about Byzantium that, that I think are, that are worth noting. The oldest ordination rites that survive, the ordination rite for the male and the ordination rite for the female are almost identical. There's one prayer that's different. Right? That, that's it. Everything else is the same. Um, the other thing that is interesting to note, though, is that um, the canons uh, set a minimum age of 25 for a male deacon, and the initial canon treating female deacons was 60, right? And then it was reduced to 40. So they were right? probably widows. Right. So the presumption, well, and we don't have, other than Phoebe, who we just don't know, we don't have, to my knowledge, any extant sources that speak of married deaconesses, right? So these were almost, the evidence we have are dealing with celibate women um, who may or may not have been um, nuns, but, but, but celibate women nonetheless. And, and of course, that then gets baked into any kind of contemporary conversation. Yeah. Uh, Greg, uh, you, you cover this a lot. You run a blog called The Deacon's Bench. Um, what do you make of the 
very fierce arguments uh, for and against the historicity. I mean, all, all the panelists here are very clear about the, the evidence, uh, you know, scant or heavy for women deacons. What do you make about the kind of uh, rebuttal of all this, and, and some t in some cases, the denial of all of this, this kind of history? Well, a lot of it is from personal bias. A lot of it is fueled by, you know, personal opinion. And as I think we've established here, there's no clear, uh, you know, history. It, it varies from place to place and from culture to culture. And there's dispute about what exactly it meant to be a deacon, what it meant to be a, a woman deacon, what they did, uh, what all of that entailed. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of, the people that I've talked to are alarmed about this because they feel that introducing women into the equation of holy orders is going to be a disruption somehow, that it's going to break the unity of orders that exist now. And that takes us to a larger theological discussion about what it means to be ordained and the, that unity of, of holy orders. Well, that's the next question, um, which to, to move on a little bit. Um, what are the arguments for and against women deacons? Young women today right, uh, in, in sort of contemporary American society are confronted um, with every possible reason not to believe in God, right? Um, and, they, and they are confronted with every possible reason to, to no longer buy into an institution that's outdated and, and so forth, right? Um, it just makes so much logical sense that a young woman struggling with her faith as a first level of kind of pastoral conversation would benefit from a woman in her community who had genuine theological training and was seen to be in a position of authority to give counseling. Now, could you do that without the ordination right? Of course you could, but, but it just seems obvious to me that this offers a great pastoral opportunity. And I would say there are a lot of men who could benefit from that of as well. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. of course. Other arguments for the ordination of women? I think having the voice of a woman in the pulpit could be profound and have a powerful impact on both men and women in the pews to hear that point of view and that perspective reflected, which is something in the history of our church we really haven't heard very much. Also having women perform baptisms having women preside at weddings. It brings a whole different element to those sacraments that I think could be very valuable and very beautiful and significant. Um, just you know, looking at, at those examples right there, having women, I know women can do this now, uh, lay women, presiding at a wake service. Mm -hmm. um, the, the feminine genius would be brought to the fore in a way that really isn't right now. We've got half of the human race that are gifted and are able to do many things, and the church is not acknowledging that officially, which is one of the things that Holy Orders does, is it claims a charism and says, yes, this is for the upbuilding of the church, and we affirm this. We worry a lot about secularization. I would contend that the church is assisting secularization by allowing so many of the gifts that are inspired by faith to not be named and identified explicitly with the church. So yeah. we push all those women who are doing great things aside and they go and collaborate with all of their secular partners when we could be saying, look, this is sacred. This is sacred what you're doing. And diaconia is for the whole community and so you're lifting up examples, both male and female, of people who can be kind of a bellwether and, a, and a, an insp inspiration to that well, diaconia. Well, in a sense, you're, you're frustrating the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, I think, I know I'm only supposed to moderate, but I think that <laughs> one of the strongest arguments for this is that women feel called. Uh, and if the Holy Spirit is calling these particular women or some women to the role of deacons, then in a sense, who are we to stand in the way? But what would you say for, well, I, what, what arguments I, for? Um, the arguments for are just what have been stated. I mean, there, there are all kinds of reasons for having women speak in this way. We might ask ourselves if uh, younger women are gonna see this as something in their trajectory, because I have a number of friends who are sort of Vatican II Catholics like myself, who I could see doing this with sort of, with a deep amount of sort of wisdom and vision and bring a lot of leadership to it. I'm concerned about where the next generation is coming from. But uh, next generation of, of, women, of women who might who might see this. I don't. I think they look at this and they're they're just. I'm not sure that they're going to find this appealing. But because. let me. Uh, 
Because they don't do institutional things, and in particular, um, they don't do institutional things that involve obedience, and I think that could be, that could be less appealing in a male power structure for women, especially for younger women. But may I ask a harder question? And my question is just, I, I think this would be a wonderful opening and a wonderful opportunity in the ways that you have all described. I'm curious at this moment in the church's history what the cost of this would be. You mentioned the feminine genius. I think that there is a lot of concern in the Roman church about what is often disparaged as gender theory and the concern that everything we know about being male and being female is completely socially constructed. I share that concern, but I don't think that's the entirety of gender theory. Right. And th what it seems to do is to bifurcate either we're going to have differences of gender with norms that accrue to them that have been very historically conditioned, but we're going to go with them, or we're going to say there's no norms that accrue to being male and being female, and that is obviously going to lead to places we don't want to go. And so the church, I am afraid, in doing this, in opening up the question of ordaining women to the diaconate, will also use it as an opportunity to more firmly define what it means to be female as they put this forward in a way that I think the church is not ready to do at this time. That's very interesting. So the idea would be that uh, it, it's a certain type of ministry and therefore it's a type of ministry for women and therefore it's typing women in that, in that particular role? Is that Abs what you're saying? Well, yes, and that, it's, and that it's going to proceed from and also give rise to much more quasi-dogmatic language about what it means to be female. And among other things, it will give uh, much fuel to the question of closing the question of the ordination of women to the priesthood even more, even more firmly. Although you could argue that once women are ordained and become their own people and become their own ministers, that the idea of what a woman deacon is totally transforms when people see them. I, and th that may happen. So, uh, certainly when they, you know, when they said that girls could be altar servers, we were talking about this earlier. Um, many of my conservative friends were opposed to it, and my progressive friends were in favor of it. And I thought the conservatives were on to something, because they said, you know, putting those girls on the altar, they said, you know, it's just they're going to get big ideas. And, you know, the fact of the matter was, well, they're, they're, they're in the same sort of state as the young men on the altar. There's, nothing has changed here. Nothing, there's, there's nothing to see. But in fact, what they got is that the symbolic value is very strong. And seeing those girls on the altar was a very powerful symbol. And yes, so women deacons could contribute to uh, breaking down that symbol, to opening it up. I, I, do, I am, however, afraid that it will come with language about being female that will be sort of chiseled into rock and will be very hard to overcome. This is, I think, something that was mentioned when the commission made its report in 2002, that to admit women just to the diaconate, um, but saying you can't go any further, would do more harm than good, it would essentially. Get their hopes up, you mean? Yeah. It would, you know, pigeonhole, as, as you were indicating, that, you know, this is the role of, of women and it can't go any, any farther than that, and that would create other problems theologically or, or ecclesiastically. The other thing that is, that needs to be kept in mind as they are weighing this over in Rome, and thank God this is above my pay scale, but how disruptive would this be to the church and to the people in the pews and to parishes and to rectories and speaking as, as a deacon, and I know that there are a lot of deacons out there who could echo this, there is a lot of prejudice against deacons by priests and by some bishops. A lot of that has changed, it's evolving, it's not as bad as it was you know, 15 or 20 years ago, um, but there is still a strong element of, you know, you stay in your place and leave me alone in some, in some areas. And I wonder how that would be received, you know, uh, to have a woman. You, you said that one of the difficulties might be that it would make women or, or encourage women to expect more. So what's the difference between uh, Greg Kandra being, uh, you know, satisfied and fulfilled in his diaconal ministry and a woman being satisfied and fulfilled in her diaconal ministry, why, why would she necessarily want more? Why would, why would that be something that would happen necessarily? Well, I think the, the concern that was expressed, you know, I was just in doing my Googling last night and reading about this from the, the 2002 report, was the concern that it would limit women and say, you can only do this. Uh, you can't become a priest. 
I could become a priest if the circumstances changed a little bit, having nothing to do with my gender. Women, it's a different situation. Right. Um, and then there are all sorts of you know, theological complications that ensue uh, from that. So they would feel so, constrained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one, of, one, of the pieces we, one of the pieces we have to remember, of course, is the commission isn't going to say yes or no. They may very well come out with a story about women deacons that is fairly attenuated and di very distinct from what the male deacon story is, or at least, or that 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 could be what happens after the commission's report. It may not be that it'll be a parallel office. Right. One of the things to notice too is that none of the other studies have been done with any women on the commission. This is the first time, and we have an equal number of women and men. So I'm interested to see what they will come up with, and whether this mix and actually putting different people at the table will result in some new insights. It's also interesting that the commission doesn't have any deacons on it either. Is that yeah, correct? It, yes. it, but you know. A there, all, as far as I understand, there is no, but uh, their mandate was to study the history. And that's not right. the same as uh, making a plan for, I'm sure if there was a mandate to go ahead and do this, they would have plenty of deacons on the commission. Right, and that, that raises the question of what exactly their mandate is and what the, what the end right. result will be. Well, let's move on to, um, if you don't, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, the, um, the Russian church, on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution, um, there was agitation from all sides, from the aristocracy, from the people, even from the bishops, to um, renew a female diaconate in Russia. And there was a, uh, a year-long council in 1917-1918 of the Russian church, one of the most significant councils in uh, you know, modern history, and one of its marching orders was to commission a study on the actual history of the female diaconate, and then everything, you know, the Bolsheviks took over and the entire thing collapsed. Um, so you had the largest Orthodox church in the world at the time ready to go back to it, um, and, you know, then they lost 90 years. Well, let's look at Greg, um, uh, thank you. Greg uh, talked about disruption, which of course can be good and bad uh, in the church. Um, what would be some of the arguments that would give people pause about women deacons? Or the re mm -hmm. either the restoration or the initiation of the women deacons? The diaconate. big theological objection has been about the uh, theology of the sacrament. So if the Holy Orders is one sacrament in three degrees, as it is defined in the Catholic Church at present, that it means that the recipient of one order, one degree of that, couldn't be different from the recipient of the other in, in terms of the gender. Uh, now, I think there's a lot of weaknesses to that argument, but that is one that has been named very, as very significant in the discussion so far. So therefore, so, so the argument is uh, if a priest, a, a deacon, a priest, and a bishop all have to be the same gender for it to be? Because it's, why well, yes, because of the unity of the sacrament would be broken if a woman were added to it. I, I'm not going to defend that. Sure, sure, that. absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, part of, part of uh, ordination involves valid matter, and valid matter right now involves being a male. Right, right, right. And in fact, that was so. put into place, you know, centuries ago, yeah. was the idea century. that you could not, yeah. Yeah. You could not ordain a, a so female body. So these are theological and ecclesiological um, arguments against. What, are there any, now you'd mentioned and hinted at, are there any pastoral uh, arguments uh, against uh, women deacons? I mean, I've heard it said, for example, that in some parts of the church, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, the global south, that they might not be uh, welcomed and it might be sort of divisive that some priests would ordain them, some, some bishops would ordain them, some bishops wouldn't. Other pastoral concerns that people have? Uh... Uh, well, so speaking for the, for the Orthodox Church, I, I think the issue, even though we, we have the, the history of doing this, the, the idea of bringing it back now um, because it's, again, it gets talked about all the time. In fact, the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew is kind of on record saying this needs to be restored. But what you have in the Orthodox Church is they look at an issue like this and they see it not for its history and for its pastoral opportunity, but they see it as a kind of manifestation of a creeping secularism brought, brought on by a godless feminism and so forth, right? And so in other words, we're going to hold the line on this, even though it's not historical, because we don't want to capitulate to the feminists. Right, right. right. And that is, seen, oh. that is seen as extremely, I mean, as very scary, because, you know, that idea that somehow our, we're sort of, we can totally construct our gender goes in the 
in the thinking of the church, that goes to abortion, that goes to our understanding of what it means to be male and female, that goes to same-sex marriage. I mean, they're, they're teeing up a number of dominoes that actually are, I think, need not fall because of that. Uh, but there, there's a sense that, well, once we start down that road, then we're into relativism, and we'll have given a story of relativism. Well, even though there's a history. And that's, what, that's what's so destructive about the kind of conversation such that it exists in the Orthodox Church. What you were saying about secularism is interesting yeah. because the other side of the coin is something that Pope Francis himself has decried, which is mm -hmm. clericalism. Right. Yeah. And there are many people who, who worry that, you know, you add women into the mix and you're clericalizing them and it's just, you know, one more headache for the church. And that but but you seem to have turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't under, I understand this, but there's this sort of, oh, we can't clericalize women, yeah. they'll become, but although it does go to the, the sort of feminine genius, the female matter, that somehow, and what I think is underneath that, that is very disruptive, is there's a public-private little switch going on here, and that to bring women into holy orders moves them out of an essentially, even though they're very skilled, they welcome their gifts, they welcome their insights, they welcome their knowledge, it moves them into a public role which is seen as somehow un, deeply unwomanly and deeply violent to their inner nature. And so that's that, we don't want to clericalize them. So that's that idea of complementarity and the different, the Petrine ministry, the Marian right. ministry, right, that right. We, we all have our different roles and. But I, you know, I just want to say that we can have complementarity between males and females and still critique the story that we've, the, the sort of cultural accretions of patriarchy basically, that we've laid upon both of these. We can critique those all the way down without throwing away the idea that there is a difference between male and female. We can, right. so I don't think, and I think people's heads can hold that thought. It's a complex thought, but people, people function that way all the time. But you know, I do think that this brings up a lot of visceral reactions for people, and that there is an anti-woman strain in the church, because it is something that's been reinforced by generation upon generation of exclusion. And now you're removing something that has grown to be accepted as the way we do it, and therefore as sacred. I don't want to underestimate the fact that this would be a big step and that it would matter, actually, how people respond to it. Because I know there are women who are administrators of parishes, women who are chaplains, women who do a lot of the things that are leadership uh, roles that men have done is cl in cler clerical situations. But I also know that uh, on a, a gut level, there are a lot of Catholics who would be disturbed by having women more visibly in part of the, cler the clergy. I want to thank our four distinguished panelists for this lively discussion in our second segment of our series, Deacons, Women, and the Call to Serve. We were talking about women deacons. Uh, for the Fordham Center on Religion and Culture and America Media, I'm Father Jim Martin. Please stay tuned for our next segment, which will be on the diaconate in the larger scope of ministry. Thank you.